Oh, good. Well, we are, as I said, going to dispense with some of the formalities. The ranking member just walked in, and we're delighted you're here this morning. Welcome to today's Energy Subcommittee hearing entitled Oversight and Management of Department of Energy National Labs and Science Activities. Last month, we held a full committee hearing with our new Energy Secretary, Ernest Moniz. At the hearing, Secretary Moniz announced that he would be undertaking a number of management and performance reforms aimed at enhancing the department's organizational effectiveness and programmatic oversight and accountability. So we're really excited about this undertaking, and the primary purpose of today's hearing is to receive testimony on the specific reforms that Congress and the administration may be able to work together to advance. Um, I am going to take the remainder of my uh, opening remarks and submit them for the record and uh, waive the remainder of my opening remarks for the record and uh, ask our ranking member, Mr. Swalwell of California, if he has any opening remarks and then we can get right into your testimony so we don't, don't get interrupted by ne our next uh, round of votes. Mr. Swalwell? Sure, thank you Chairman Lummis for holding this hearing today and I wanna thank our witnesses for being here. I represent uh, a district in Northern California that has two uh, national laboratories, uh, Sandia and Lawrence Livermore, and also uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Lofgren from uh, Silicon Valley area, also uh, just outside her district, but has been a faithful advocate for those laboratories as well, which I am always grateful to have an ally uh, as a neighbor. Uh, I just want to highlight that these laboratories employ uh, many of our country's brightest uh, minds in science and engineering, and they continue to inspire, train, and support new generation uh, of American researchers and industry leaders. They also serve as an important path by which new technologies can move to market in ways that benefit uh, its public and private partners alike, and in turn, the American taxpayer. And while it's important to recognize the great work being done across the country by our national labs, as other researchers supported by the Department of Energy programs, it's equally important to consider what opportunities exist to make improvements. And that's why I look forward to today's hearing. And for one example I wanted to highlight was the recommendation in the report to merge the department's Undersecretary for Energy and Undersecretary for Science into a single Undersecretary for Science and Technology, which I believe makes a lot of sense as it would finally establish a single individual in DOE with both the sole responsibility and authority to advance new energy technologies from basic research through commercialization activities. This report also recommends a number of interesting ways that we may be able to accelerate technology transfer and improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our labs. And I look forward to exploring these ideas further with our DOE laboratory witnesses shortly. And also, uh, just about a uh, three iron outside my district is the uh, Berkeley National Lab, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory as well. And I appreciate their staff's efforts to continue to update and educate me on the great work they're doing there. So thank you for holding this hearing, uh, Chairman Lummis, and with that I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Um, if there are any other members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. Anyone? Thank you. Well, now we'll introduce our witnesses. Our first witness today is Mr. Matthew Stepp, Senior Policy Analyst with the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Mr. Stepp previously served as at the Breakthrough Institute, a think tank focusing on political thinking in the 21st century. In 2009, Mr. Stepp was a fellow at the National Academies of Science, where he worked on the Transportation Research Board. He earned his master's from Rochester Institute of Technology. Our second witness is Mr. Jack Spencer, research fellow at the Heritage Foundation's Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies. Previously, he served at the Bagcock and Wilcox companies, where he worked on commercial, civilian, and military nuclear energy issues. Prior to this, he worked at the Heritage Foundation as an analyst for defense and national security. Mr. Spencer earned his master's from the University of Limerick in Ireland. Our third witness is Dr. Tom Mason, director of Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Dr. Mason joined Oak Ridge in 1998 as science director of the Spallation Neutron Source Project and was named Associate Lab Director in 2001. Before Oak Ridge, Dr. Mason was a member of the physics faculty at the University of Toronto. He enters doctorate in condensed matter sciences at McMaster University. Our final witness is Dr. Dan Arvizu. 
director of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Dr. Arvizu was appointed to direct in 2005 and was reappointed another six-year term in 2011. Prior to that, Dr. Arvizu was an executive with Sandia National Labs and began his career at AT&T Bell Telephone Labs. He earned his PhD in mechanical engineering from Stanford. Welcome one and all. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. Um, before recognizing our first witness, I'd like to take a moment to explain how our first two witnesses will proceed. The report these witnesses are testifying about was a joint effort between the Heritage Foundation and the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, which is fabulous because they tend to be on opposite sides of the political spectrum. They have submitted joint testimony for today, but will each be given five minutes for oral testimony. So we're just thrilled that you are working together, and I now recognize Mr. Stepp for five minutes to present his testimony. Uh, thank you. Chairman Lummis, uh, Ranking Member Swalwell and the committee, I want to thank you and appreciate the opportunity to appear for you in front of you today. Uh, I think this is a particularly important uh, topic because Congress has an enormous opportunity to turn the national labs into engines of innovation and uh, economic growth with minimal budget impact. My name is Matthew Stepp. I'm a senior policy analyst at ITIF, where I direct its energy innovation program. And from ITIF's point of view, the National Labs are one of the single most important public institutions in the nation's innovation enterprise. Uh, and they can serve as a central to, uh, tool for boosting job growth, creating regional economic development, and supporting America's national research goals. So I think just like federal investments in research and uh, development writ large, the National Labs uh, are fundamentally important to America and America's future. Uh, but however, the lab system as it's currently managed and organized is falling short of its innovation potential. And ultimately, this is why ITF spearheaded the nonpartisan effort along with colleagues from the Heritage Foundation and the Center for American Progress to try to find some common ground for reform. And th there are really three principal causes that we focused. The first is that uh, there's bureaucratic micromanagement uh, at the labs that muddles and slows the research process. Uh, two, the lab research is funded by small technology-centric grants rather than funding long-term research outcomes, uh, such as those developed at the DOE's innovation hubs and RPE. And three, the lab's relationship with industry is often weak, uh, restricting the appreciable economic outcome of the research and limiting potential industry partnerships, uh, particularly with small businesses. And so although my written testimony takes a deeper look at over a dozen policies, I just want to highlight three, I think, that are uh, maybe the most important. First, Congress should devolve the management of the labs from centralized DOE control to a more pure version of the GOCO model, uh, where contractor accountability is the chief method of oversight. Uh, so Congress could do this by creating a task force consisting of the labs, DOE, uh, industry and academic stakeholders to target duplicative regulations that DOE must eliminate or change. So for example, one area of reform is the size of the, and the extent of the DOE site offices and the extent that those site offices are involved in the day-to-day decision-making of the labs, uh, which is currently dictated from Washington. Uh, second, Congress should provide the labs better incentives and more flexibility uh, to partner with industry to spur technology transfer. And so the current system of agreements is complex and oftentimes onerous to navigate. So one way Congress can do this is amend the stevenson Weidler Innovation and Technology Act of 1980 to allow the labs to conduct collaborative, non-national security-related research with third parties uh, without DOE sign-off. And obviously this could be implemented on a pilot basis at first, and it would still require annual review and oversight. But I think it would greatly accelerate the process of creating industry lab partnerships and accelerate the process of moving uh, research from the lab to market. And third, I think Congress should begin implementing the important process of reforming the Department of Energy, as Ranking Member Swalwell uh, indicated. And I think the key point here is that they should do so around encouraging innovation uh, rather than the stovepipe basic versus applied research programs or the technology programs that we see today. And there's many steps to this. I think the, the first and most important, as was stated, is, is combining the Office of Science and the Office of the Undersecretary of Energy into one streamlined Office of, the, of Science and Technology. Uh, this would take effectively put all non-NNSA labs, so 13 of the 17 national labs, under one single uh, leadership, 
which I believe would create better research coordination, more productive funding, as well as opportunities for long-term planning. Uh, so in conclusion, I think what's important to state here is as the United States faces new and intense competition for global innovation leadership, the labs can certainly serve as, national, as a national competitive advantage. And in fact, uh, they fundamentally must do so if we want to continue to lead the world in innovation. But it can only do so if it's, ref if it's reformed into a more nimble research system, which doing so requires starting at the top with changes that don't just tinker around the edges and reform the system as a whole. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Stepp, for those really specific recommendations. Mr. Spencer, you will have five minutes. Thank you, Mrs. Chairman, Ranking Member Swalwell, and members of the committee. The submitted remarks, the report, as you know, is a document where we all agree. Um, what, I'm what I'm going to do is move away from that just slightly, not into areas that we don't agree on, but rather focus my comments on into how these recommendations in this report fits in to more of a conservative free market vision and why this fits into Heritage's um, vision of how federal research should move forward. <clears throat> My name is Jack Spencer, and I'm a research fellow at the Heritage Foundation. The views I express in this testimony are my own and should not be construed as representing any official position of the Heritage Foundation. The work that ultimately became the reimagining report began some three years ago. At Heritage, we were becoming concerned that America's government research enterprise was getting off track. We felt that it was quickly becoming a mechanism to subsidize the private sector, to advance fleeting political agendas, or even sometimes use to pay back special interests. So some colleagues and I decided to take a detailed look at the Depar at Department of Energy spending. We quickly began identifying significant problems throughout the budget. The problems roughly fell into four categories. Too much focus on commercialization, too much programmatic duplication, too much political influence, and too many subsidies. Simply creating a list of programmatic reductions, however, was not enough. What we found we needed was real reform, and the reimagining report puts forth that reform. Though reimagining is decidedly nonpartisan and unapologetically appeals to stakeholders across the ideological spectrum, in developing the report, my objective was to ensure that its recommendations were consistent with a conservative free market vision. Ultimately, we determined that many of the problems facing the nation's research establishment emanated from an overbearing, Washington-generated bureaucracy that was driven more by politics and a desire to control than by science, markets, or good governance. Thus, we focused our recommendations, we focused on recommendations that broadly decentralize authority, realign incentives to be consistent with more desired outcomes, and that harness the power of markets. To achieve this, first we reorganized the Department of Energy Research Bureaucracy into a single unified office of science and technology. This is critical from a conservative, limited market perspective. Roughly speaking, the bureaucracy currently consists of separate entities that conduct basic research and those that conduct applied research. The applied research generally includes activities that are further along the technology development spectrum and are theoretically closer to commercialization. This is the type of research that pri the private sector should shoulder from our estimation. By removing a bureaucracy created specifically to support those activities, we begin to diminish the institutional bias towards it. Now this does not eliminate applied research from the Department of Energy. Indeed, those of us who oppose it must continue to fight that fight on a program by program basis. Secondly, we drastically reduce Washington micromanagement of the labs. Currently, lab managers must follow arcane bureaucratic rules that drive up costs, increase bureaucracy, and perpetuate general inefficiency. We recommend a performance-based contracting system where the contractors are free to meet their contractual obligations largely as they see fit rather than by prescriptive oversight by the DOE. And finally, we free lab management contractors to engage with the private sector, universities, or other agencies based on market demand and allow them to keep a portion of the revenues as part of their management fee. The federal government today largely pushes research into the market. Our approach creates a market incentive for, to transfer technology out of the labs. For conservatives, it promotes near-term spending cuts by removing the temptation for government to use taxpayer funds to, to fund research facilities used by non-federal government entities. 
We create a system where such users pay directly for those services. This eliminates any justification for taxpayers to fund it. It also sets, sets the stage potentially for shrinking the size of government. Ultimately, if a facility attracts no funding, then it should be eliminated. If it attracts adequate third-party funding, then maybe it should be privatized. By implementing these reforms, we believe that we can achieve five distinct outcomes. We can rationalize the, lab si rationalize the size of the lab infrastructure. We can better focus taxpayer resources on those things that really advance the national mission. We can efficiently move, more efficiently I should say, move commercially attractive technology into the marketplace. We can yield less government waste and more efficient operations. And finally, we can allow technology to be pulled by markets, not pushed by government. In conclusion, the nation can benefit from federally funded research. We see it every day in the realm of national security, to give an example. The government gets off track, however, when it attempts to directly intervene in the commercial sector. Like it or not, the federal government is a horrible venture capitalist. This is not to suggest, however, that the government-funded that government -funded research cannot lead to commercial success. Who doesn't use the internet or GPS? The model for translating government spending into commercial success is not to build a program for the purpose of commercialization. After all, GPS was not the result of a government program to yield some commercial product, but rather was developed to meet a national security need. The key is to develop a system that ensures that taxpayer research dollars are focused on meeting the na nation's research needs first, then encourage interactions with third parties should those research activities yield something that has commercial application. Our recommendations do precisely that. Thank you for your time today. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. I now recognize Dr. Mason for five minutes. Chairman Lummis, Ranking Member Swalwell, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Uh, my name is Tom Mason. I'm the director of the Department of Energy's Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and I also serve as a member of the National Lab Directors Council. Uh, the council is concerned about many of the issues being considered at this hearing, so I would like to thank the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, the Center for American Progress, and the Heritage Foundation for stimulating this broader discussion. As context for my remarks, I'd like to briefly describe Oak Ridge National Lab. As DOE's largest science and energy lab, ORNL has an R&D portfolio that spans the range from fundamental science to demonstration and deployment of breakthrough technologies for clean energy and national security. Our mission includes both scientific discovery and innovation. So we place a high value on what we call translational R&D, coordinating the basic research and applied technology to solve compelling problems. Work with industry is a key part of this process. We have several tools for engaging with the private sector. The department's Work for Others program, cooperative R&D agreements, or CRADAs, and the new Agreements to Commercialize Technology, or ACT, as well as user facility agreements that provide industry with access to powerful tools for R&D. Building and operating user facilities is a signature role for the national labs. These facilities and their associated research programs add value to the innovation process. For example, at ORNL, we have combined CRADAs and cost share agreements to work with Caterpillar and Honeywell on a new alloy that is now in commercial use. This work has been advanced by neutron scattering measurements made at the high flux isotope reactor. And we're helping large and small companies exploit the world's second most powerful supercomputer to develop new energy technologies. Other nations recognize the value of this model. Not long ago, the director of the Institute of Policy and Management of the Chinese Academy of Sciences said that China is making progress in stimulating industrial innovation and beginning to build world-class universities, but does not yet have an equivalent of the U.S. national labs. However, they're working on it. They're planning to move the world's most powerful supercomputer, you'll note I said we were the second most powerful, from, from Shangsha to Dongguan, where the China spallation neutron source is being built. And consideration is being given to shifting several major research institutes to an area north of Beijing where they can take advantage of a new synchrotron. I think this demonstrates that the U.S. model remains, remains valid, but nevertheless, we should always be looking for ways that we can improve. You asked about potential improvements to the DOE lab relationship, management practices, and oversight functions. And I believe that the GOCO model, the government-owned contractor-operated lab model, has served the nation well. 
Um, its flexibility has allowed the labs to respond to changing national priorities and issues. At Oak Ridge, we recently used this flexibility to right-size our workforce, update employee benefits, and streamline our operations. Uh, we recognize the budget pressures that we all face. Uh, we benefited from having the kind of relationship with DOE that was specified in the early management and operation contracts, which called for, and I quote, a spirit of partnership and friendly cooperation. But as the working group found, the GOCO model can certainly be updated and improved. The working group's recommendations fall into three categories. With regard to the first, transforming lab management, uh, working to build a, con a robust contractor assurance system has laid a solid foundation for a new look at stewardship. The second set of recommendations speaks to DOE's organizational structure. Secretary Moniz has made a commitment to integrate the science and energy missions, and I believe that is an excellent move. He clearly understands the need to expand the kind of synergistic interactions between basic and applied research that already takes place at the laboratory level. Uh, and, and, and by combining uh, at the undersecretary level the R&D programs managed by the Office of Science and the Energy Offices under one undersecretary, I believe that could be further advanced. Um, it would also allow for the extension of some of the best practices developed by the Office of Science in laboratory management and strategic planning to the energy programs. The last set of recommendations on moving technology to the market, I think expanding the AC tech, ACT mechanism uh, would help the labs work with a wider variety of partners. It could provide a pathway to flexible pricing for proprietary R&D, which was another recommendation. And for labs whose R&D portfolios intersect the commercial world, which is not all of them, I might point out, Adding weight to tech transfer in our performance plans would increase emphasis on this activity, particularly if we also gain flexibility in, in establishing and executing partnerships. New metrics should adjust multiple aspects of industry engagement, not just licensing deals and revenue, however. And they need, will need to take into account the high failure rate for all new technology ventures. It would also be helpful if our laboratory-directed R&D funds could be used to support tech maturation. In closing, the working group's goal of ensuring that national labs remain effective and continue to deliver national benefits to the taxpayers is one we all share. I look forward to participating in a broad discussion of how we can best attain it. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Dr. Mason. And now we will wrap up with <laughs> Dr. Arvizu. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Member, uh, ranking Member Swalwell and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to discuss uh, the importance of the Department of Energy's National Labs and the recent uh, reimagining National Lab report. I'm Dan Arvizu, Director of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado. I've been associated with federal research in the National Laboratory System throughout my mostly four decades uh, professional career. I started with Bell Labs, I worked uh, 20 years at Sandia National Laboratories, and I've been in REL for uh, the past eight and a half years. I've also spent time in the, in the private sector. I'm currently chairman of the National Science Board as well. I'm pleased that the Reimagining the National Labs report is drawing attention to this critically important item of high impact research that can't or won't be supported solely by the private sector. The, the report certainly does make a number of sound and valuable recommendations, which is all the more impressive given the distinct ideology and political differences between the three organizations that sponsored it. At the same time, the report readily concedes that the three sponsors did not achieve agreement on the three fundamental issues of the questions of funding levels, funding priorities, and the role of government. Uh, so while the report does offer a number of beneficial recommendations, and I'm very pleased to discuss those, we should not lose sight of the fact that we simply will not be able to optimize the impact of the national laboratories without also addressing these key questions of funding priority and roles. We shouldn't also overlook the fact that the overarching missions of the national laboratories are a key strength of the entire complex. The four DOE missions, national security, science, energy, environmental management, remain as vital and relevant to our nation today as they ever have in our history. I strongly believe that these missions should continue to be the driving force in the continuing oversight and management of our laboratories, and an essential element in any management reform efforts as well. National security, science, energy, and environmental management have determined the core competency and defined the key capabilities for the complex as a whole and, and each laboratory individually. And these long identified and well under understood missions ideally should be the prism through which Congress, the Department of Energy, and the labs themselves make decisions on moving forward. Let me take a moment to explain why the national labs, these unique national assets, should be nurtured 
with robust and contingent investment. First, DOE laboratories are addressing critical national security, energy technology, and fundamental science. They conduct the world's leading scientific research, ensure that America will have an abundant, affordable, clean, and reliable energy future, and protect the nation by keeping our nuclear deterrent reliable and safe. Our national labs are the homes of, of scientific and engineering capabilities that are the engines of innovation and allow us to compete in a rapidly evolving global economy. These capabilities tackle our long-term problems, but also our near-term emergencies, such as the labs' responses to events like the Gulf oil spill and the 9-11 attacks and Hurricane Katrina, Superstorm Sandy. Our national labs design, build, and operate unique scientific instrumentation and steward research and user facilities serving tens of thousands of scientists and engineers from both the private sector and academia. With respect to the report conclusions, I would strongly agree that there is no bright line between basic and applied research. If you want to be market relevant, you can't separate the crucial role played by applied research working in concert with more fundamental research, as is frequently practiced within our national laboratories. Additionally, to further grow U.S. competitiveness, I concur with the report that we should accelerate commercialization by putting more emphasis on tech transfer, but in the context of the mission objectives. One of the principal conclusions of the report is, the, is, is that the historical model of organizing and managing the national labs as government-owned, contractor-operated labs is fundamentally sound, but has eroded over time. I agree. The department and the lab complex should work together to recapture the best elements of the original GOCO model and the department giving laboratories directions on what needs to be done and the laboratories being able to decide how to do it. I am pleased to say Secretary Moniz is working to that end. Additional flexibility and accountability are key to achieving that objective. Finally, the inconsistency of funding different labs, different lab functions, and maintaining lab infrastructure is a systemic problem that must be addressed. Apart from designated user facilities, the, real the reality is that labs don't often receive the funding they need to adequately steward the national capabilities on their campuses. This results in inconsistent performance across the complex, and it means that industry and universities face obstacles and considerably higher costs in partnering with laboratories. In conclusions, I applaud the, the authors of the report for underscoring a very important question, and that is how can we best marshal our national research resources to surmount the critical challenges of our time and the uncertain challenges of our future? Thank you for your attention. I look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Arvizu, and thank all of you for being available for questioning today. Um, I'm reminding members that the committee rules limit questions to five minutes. Um, the chair will, after uh, one other housekeeping matter, uh, start the opening round of questions. I do, before we begin that, ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter from Secretary of Energy Ernest Moniz, responding to a letter ranking member Swalwell and I sent him in late June of this year regarding the national labs. And I say that because it's only been two weeks since we sent him the letter and we've already gotten a response. So uh, we're off to a great start in terms of our working relationship with the Secretary and I want to compliment him on uh, his prompt response. Uh, without I'm still hopeful he'll uh, take us up on our offer to visit uh, Wyoming and California. Indeed, and uh, we're, we're really looking forward to a positive working relationship with the Secretary. Uh, so without objection, so ordered. and. Uh, Without further ado, the chair recognizes herself for five minutes in this first round of questioning. The Reimagining National Labs report is primarily focused on the structure of the 16 government-owned contractor-operated labs. However, there's this unique critter in the DOE lab system. It's a government-owned, government-operated lab, the National Energy Technology Lab, which conducts fossil fuel R&D. I'd like to ask each of you, is there any reason that the fossil fuel lab should not also be contractor operated, empowering it to take advantage of the operational efficiencies and flexibilities associated with private management and the report's recommendations? Would any of you like to respond to that question? Mr. Stepp, I'll thank just, you. I'll just jump in and say there's no management operation or scientific reason why it shouldn't be uh, contractor operated. Um, 
I think maybe the lab directors can provide a, more of a history on why nettle was, remains a go-go, but uh, I, I think the recommendations we outline in the report are fully applicable to, to nettle moving forward in addition, in addition to making it a contractor model rather than a government operation model. Mr. Spencer? Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. Um, if you look at what nettle does, where its funding comes from, its missions, um, to me, it's unclear why the government is involved in any of those things at all for uh, the conventional fuels industry. So at a minimum, I think it's appropriate to make it a GOCO, and one may make a strong argument for going even beyond that. Dr. Mason. I could maybe offer a bit of a historical perspective um, why that distinction, because it does stand out as a bit of an anomaly. It has its origins in the way that DOE was created uh, in the 70s uh, in response to the Arab oil embargo, uh, when the Atomic Energy Commission uh, was broken apart into a regulatory component, the NRC, and something that became the Energy Research and Development Agency, and ultimately DOE that incorporated elements from other government agencies like Interior. And, and Nettle came from that side of the equation, the interior side of the equation, so it had been operated as a government-operated uh, entity, whereas the Atomic Energy Commission had the GOCO uh, tradition going back to the Manhattan Project. And uh, I think the, the reason it persists is because of the difficulty of the transition, and that's, that's really the, the challenge. It, it would be uh, complicated to do, and um, you know, there's uh, lots of stakeholders involved, and sometimes these things are, are hard to hard to get to. Yeah. Dr. Arvizu. Uh yes, that, and that, by the way, would be a great question to ask Secretary Moniz. Okay. Uh, I think he uh, he clearly has has some history uh, with this, and and I believe uh, uh, there has been uh, evaluation of um, of making that conversion in previous times. Um, and I think it would have to be carefully considered uh, based on uh, mission objectives and the things that are part of that, but agree with what my colleagues have said. Thank you. Um, while I have, while you have the microphone, Dr. Arvizu and Dr. Mason, about how many of, of the WFO, CRADA, and ACT agreements are your lab's partner to, would you guess? Total number of agreements? It, it, the the agreements for commercializing technology, how many of those have you used roughly? I mean, uh, very roughly. Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, and one of the, uh, so I'll give you a, a crisp answer, which is uh, we have over 130 active co uh, cooperative research and development agreements. We have a total of 400 and, and change uh, number of agreements that relate to work for others, uh, technical services agreements. Uh, and other forms of, of uh, relationships that we have with industry. It is part of our mission to work with industry, and as a consequence, I think we probably have the lion's share of those uh, relative to other national labs. Okay. Dr. Mason? I don't have the exact numbers, but I do know that we inter interact with uh, close to a 1,000 companies through a variety of different mechanisms, like the Creators Work for Others and User Agreements. ACT is a new mechanism. We received approval to participate in the pilot for that earlier this year, and so we're just in the process of negotiating the first ACT agreements. Actually, interestingly, one of the first ones may be with our state government, uh, who found that the uh, flexibilities embedded it were equally important to them, although it was originally imagined that it would be most valuable for industry. Thank you, Mr. Mason. I now recognize Mr. Smallwell for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lummis. And I wanted to uh, first start with uh, Dr. Mason, and I appreciate you uh, appearing today uh, as the uh, minority witness. I want to take a minute to touch on a critical part of the laboratory workforce that may often be overlooked, and that's the construction and maintenance workers. And it's essential to have uh, dedicated, trained maintenance workers who understand the challenges of a day-to-day -day, uh, work that is conducted at our national laboratories. And my question for you, Dr. Mason, is uh, what you can tell me about what we can do uh, to ensure uh, that we're protecting these valuable employees and ensure that uh, they're paid a prevailing wage and that laboratories are not uh, you know, going around uh, Davis-Bacon requirements or uh, using temporary workers to not have to comply with uh, prevailing wage laws. 
Well, you know, first, uh, any any construction project that we undertake is is subject to, to Davis Bacon, and so we go through the Davis Bacon determination to determine what's covered work, and then the covered work is subject to the prevailing wage requirements. So that's that's built into how we do construction projects. Um, in terms of the ongoing maintenance, uh, which is which is not David Bacon, I can speak to Oak Ridge. Maybe my colleague could speak to how things are at NREL. But um, about 15% of our workforce is is the crafts, and and uh, they they are represented by the Atomic Trades and Labor Council. We have a collective bargaining agreement with them, uh, and and uh, in fact, the the wages that we pay are are at the in fact probably slightly above the prevailing wage level. Uh, that would apply if it were Davis Bacon work, as in the case of a construction project. And you're absolutely right; every element of our workforce is critical to getting the job done. Um, and and I, I would note that, um, as I mentioned, you know, in, in preparing to deal with the budget constraints we have, we've been looking hard at our at our wages and our benefits. And in fact, um, as all of the labs went through this period with with the pay freeze that's uh, been experienced in the federal system. Of course, that did not apply to collective bargaining agreements, but we were able to reach agreement with the ATLC where they undertook exactly the same austerity measures that applied to all of the other staff uh, because of the recognition that it was important to protect jobs. So I think we have a very strong relationship and, and all our employees are, are paid you know, at rates that are market competitive. That's actually one of the benefits of the GOCO model. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Also, and for Dr. Arvizu, uh, how are the national laboratories working with private industry? And uh, what I mean is, can you describe the process uh, for a private company to begin, to begin working in an unclassified way with a national laboratory? And what can we do to expedite uh, this process to uh, increase uh, the technology uh, transfer? So there are a number of uh, mechanisms that we use, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Mason has, has mentioned a, a few of those. Uh, the, the, the one that we use uh, mostly is uh, the, uh, the, the technical services agreement because they're very, very quick, and they allow us to uh, essentially put agreements in place in less than two weeks, and, and essentially that's what we do. Um, they are... Uh, those are agreements that don't have intellectual property sorts of uh, expectations, and, and so that doesn't need to be negotiated necessarily. Um, the, the, the workhorse of our agreements, though, is the, the Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, and we have a number of those. Um, it, the way industry comes in is uh, they can come in under um, a number of different um, pathways. Uh, they can cost share research with us. They can uh, do a total funds in research opportunity. They can they can be part of a of a DOE solicitation program that ultimately ends up in a in a cooperative agreement. Uh, but we have standard agreements that that uh, can be executed very quickly. We have others when, that if there needs to be tailored negotiation terms uh, take a bit longer. Um, so it's in that. Uh, method of trying to get to the most flexible items possible that there's opportunity for improvement. Great. So the, the ACT is one of those. Thank you, Dr. Arvisa. And quickly, uh, Mr. Stepp, uh, one of the recommendations is that, the, is that Congress allow the labs to uh, charge a market rate, which I think is an interesting idea, but I'm concerned that this could uh, crowd out uh, smaller, uh, more innovative ideas that don't necessarily have funding uh, behind them, users that don't have the funding behind them, and do you uh, fear that uh, unintended consequence? Or intended consequence, I hope uh, not, but. No, I don't think that's an intended consequence. No, I don't necessarily fear. I think there's, there's a concern, a larger concern that, say, smaller businesses are, are currently unable to work with the labs in a, in a large way. And so I think what the uh, charging a market rate allows is actually provides an incentive for the labs to do more of this type of collaborative work with industry so they'll have more of an opportunity to work with those smaller entities. I think there are other recommendations in the report and elsewhere that uh, would actually help smaller entities work with the labs. I think that so it's not a one size fits all. Uh, I think that uh, the adding that market incentive broadens the abilities that allows to work with them, but there has to be complementary policies to go along with it to help the smaller entities. Great. Thank you, Chairman Lemus. I thank the ranking member and now yield to the gentleman from Illinois who's always at these hearings. We so appreciate your, your valuable attendance. Uh, uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Holtgren.
Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, all you do as well. Thank you for doing this. Thank you all for being here. I do think this is a really important discussion and uh, appreciate each of you, the work that you've done in different areas, uh, specifically in the labs or even just helping us figure out the future of our laboratory system. I love serving on the Science Committee. Uh, I am very proud of the new uh, bipartisan uh, National Science and Laboratories Caucus uh, that is, is growing and active. I absolutely believe in our laboratories and I'm so proud of uh, what has happened in our laboratories and what I know what is going to happen in our laboratories. So I think this is a very important discussion to be having of what does the future look like. Uh, and I agree with many of the conclusions that were set out in the study and uh, of, of giving some more flexibility, uh, getting less micromanagement from top down, making sure that we're protecting from pushing agendas through our labs but instead allowing labs to do research. For me, it really goes back to a core fundamental belief that I have as a conservative is that government has to do what the private sector can't do. Uh, and whatever the private sector can do, we shouldn't do. Uh, and whenever, you know, there's balances there, certainly when it's technology transfer, that's where we struggle in figuring out what that is that line that we should do and the lab should do and what should private sector do. I don't think there's any question, or not much question at least, when it gets to basic scientific research, that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to put together a business plan to sell to shareholders to do basic scientific research. Uh, and that's something we have to do. So one of my frustrations, and I guess a challenge I would make uh, as a follow-up to the study, or kind of next steps to the study, is really recognizing, I think we have uh, a wonderful lab system, but also very diverse. Uh, you mentioned it a little bit in the, the study, but I think we have to recognize that there's some labs that uh, aren't positioned to provide tech transfer. There's some labs that absolutely are and should be kind of on that forefront of making the connection with the private sector. There's others who are doing the work that the private sector can't do, uh, and uh, we, we need to keep doing that. So that's something I want to uh, ask you about. Um, Specifically with laboratories, I'm, I'm passionate about Fermilab. It's in my district. Uh, I'm open about that, but other laboratories as well. You know, I know um, uh, Princeton Physics Lab, Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Lab. Uh, these other laboratories also have a very specific mission uh, that doesn't necessarily lend itself to tech transfer, but does absolutely have an, a vital role of basic scientific research. So just uh, want to get your response on that, of how you see that fitting of those very um, focused mission labs. Uh, how, how does that interact with, with your report, specifically Mr. Spencer, Mr. Stepp? Uh, I'll, I'll start with that. I think that's a really great question. It's a key issue. It's one that we were... Um, very careful to address in the report. In fact, we didn't propose any reforms that were kind of a blanket approach, a one-size-fit-all. Uh, I'll give you an example. We want to uh, make technology transfer a bigger part of the annual evaluations of the labs, but we were careful not to specifically say what the weights and how specifically that should be done because we recognize each of the labs are different. Uh, so, in fact, we would hope that DOE and the individual labs would negotiate what those weights and, and so forth would be, uh, recognizing that labs like Fermi uh, are going to do less technology transfer just inherent to the science than, say, uh, an NREL would actually do. So I think that's a key question. And I think that's built into some of the recommendations that we make. Yeah, that is a great question, and it's a concern that's been brought up by a number of folks. There's nothing in the report that prohibits this, uh, funding for discrete projects. So the way we would look at this is we're going to continue to debate amongst us all what, the la what should be funded through the labs, what we decide are core government missions. And these are the types of things that you're talking about. So there's nothing in the, la in the report that prohibits any of that or increases it. What we're talking about is once we have that debate and you have that funding in place, there's other stuff. What are the mechanisms to better rationalize the lab infrastructure that's left over, what are the mechanisms that we can put in place that even on the basic science piece that we can help identify earlier on what might be market interesting in the marketplace. So that's really where our recommendations focus on, not on that core function. So all of those things that you're talking about will still be there, assuming 
you win the debates in the in the it, you know during the funding process. Yeah, well, and that's the challenge, and uh, I, I want to be engaged in it. You know that uh, the, the people on the committee know this that uh, this is important, and clo I'll close with this, and you all know this as well. But uh, one of my physicists, uh, a lot of my constituents are much smarter than I am, which I'm thankful for. Uh, but especially my physicist constituents. But one of them said something that there's really two kinds of science: uh, Newtonian science and Edisonian science. The market is excellent at the Edisonian science of, of, of taking great ideas, new discoveries, and applying them to make our lives better and make a profit. Not a good thing for everybody. Newtonian science, the basic fundamentals of what makes something work, the market has trouble doing that type of research. And so I just want to make sure as we're going through this, and again, I'll spend some more time going through the research and would love to sit down with you uh, more directly on this and maybe even have something with, uh, with the caucus or follow up with the committee to talk further on that. But just to make sure again that if, if all else fails, we're still doing the Newtonian science, the new discovery, the things that are going to inspire young people to want to join uh, in and study STEM education. And I think that's going to be a really important thing that I'd also, and I'm sorry I'm going over, but real quickly, uh, that uh, STEM education is so important and our labs are a key part of STEM education. We need to be talking about that. Kids are smart in seventh and eighth grade. They're going to see if we don't believe in, in science as a country, they're going to choose to go into law or finance or something else. Uh, we need to make sure that they see that there is an opportunity for them to do research and discovery right here in America, and our labs are an important part, part for that to happen. So thank you. Thank you for your generosity and time, and I yield back. The chair just isn't going to interrupt that kind of passion and enthusiasm. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Holtgren. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. La. Well, Lofton. thank you very much, and it was uh, wonderful to hear Mr. Holtgren's comments, and it reminds me of the long-standing bipartisan support we have in the Congress for basic research. Um, it is good that we reiterate that because you know we've had little dust-ups on other things, but if we continue to have that solid support across the political spectrum, I think our country's future will be much brighter, and it was good to hear a reaffirmation of that. I wanted to talk a little bit about, I realize that the focus really has been on the Office of Science uh, Research, but looking at the report on uh, page 40 and 41 on the uh, NNSA, it, it seems to me, I mean, over the years I've heard some concern expressed on Office of Science Management, and I'm sure that there can be improvements made, but it pales compared to the criticism I have heard from N about NNSA management. And as you point out on page 41, NNSA does have a national weapons focus, but they, they, they also fund science. And I think if we do not focus on the outrageous mismanagement uh, at NNSA, with the most of the money is there, and, and tie in the reform effort because they have a huge role to play in science as well as uh, uh, weapons security, that we're going to miss a, a big bet. Now I realize Armed Services also has, a uh, committee has some jurisdiction, okay. but we do too in terms of the science issue. And I'm wondering, uh, Mr. Stepp and Mr. Spence, I realize that wasn't the focus of the report, but uh, if you think that some of the recommendations made, well, I'll just give you an example. NNSA headquarters made a, a, a budget finding about Lawrence Livermore National Lab in terms of what they could um, yield uh, on user fees that was completely made up. They never consulted with the lab. They never investigated whether were, there were any customers other than Russia or China, which for security reasons would be problematic, um, and they just put a number in there, which, since it is cannot be done, will result in the layoffs of hundreds of physicists at the lab, which will critically impact our ability to even run the stockpile stewardship program. Do you have a comment on that? Uh, sure. This this uh, received a significant debate over the year and a half we spent doing this project. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you my personal opinion. There's not one recommendation in the report that I think shouldn't be applied to the NNSA labs. Um, 
I think ultimately we decided that because Congress is taking a very unique and special look at NNSA and there's now a task force that came out of NDAA and, and what they're going to propose, that given all those complexities, we didn't want to get these recommendations wrapped up in those things. But we do make the comment and report that ultimately spurring more technology transfer, more efficient management, all of those principles should be taken to NNSA. And ultimately, whether or not Congress decides to uh, reform the NNSA management structure, give it back to DOE, do whatever it is, I think those principles hold for whatever that new structure is going to be. And ultimately, my personal get is that at the end of the day, all of the labs would be under unified leadership, and we wouldn't have to split non-NNSA and NNSA labs up as we propose. Um, but I think we're happy to at least get 13 of the labs under one unified leadership. No, I understand. Right. Are, are there other witnesses who wanted to comment on that? Um, well, certainly, you know, the NNSA labs do contribute a lot to both the science and the energy missions. And similarly, actually, you know, at my lab, I do a lot of work in support of the nonproliferation programs for NNSA. And in fact, there's a very healthy interaction between some of the technologies developed. Right. And, and so, as, as, the, as Mr. Stepp said, um, although in, in areas of national security, there are some things that you stay away from tech transfer because, sure. you know, we call that espionage. Uh, there's, uh, there, there are a lot of innovations that have flowed out of the national security missions, and, and just as was the case with GPS. And, and if I could add to that, uh, having spent 20 years in a, in a national security laboratory, uh, there is great synergy between what the, uh, the NNSA labs and, and, the, and, the and the bulk of the national labs do. Uh, the, the value and strength of the national labs is in their cohesive interaction, and we do a lot of work with Sandy uh, as, a, as a consequence of that. M Madam Chairman, I, uh, I think this is such an important issue in, in its joint jurisdiction between our committee and armed services, and maybe we could discuss doing something with armed services to take a look at this, because I think if we don't, the science mission gets lost in the shuffle, and that would really impair our, our nation's future. So I thank you for um, allowing me to ask these questions. I thank the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski. Thank you. I'd like to start off uh, by commending the authors uh, for this, uh, all the great work that went into preparing this report. Uh, the fact that the report is co-authored, as uh, the, uh, the chairwoman said, is co-authored by experts from think tanks across the ideological spectrum, as well as the ITIF, is really testament to the wide appeal that I think a lot of these recommendations are, are going to have. And I certainly think uh, there are a lot of very appealing recommendations in there. I'm especially interested in the recommendations regarding technology transfer at the, uh, at the labs. I've long been a proponent of facilitating technology transfer from all federally funded scientific research, uh, that which goes on um, at uh, research universities and uh, also the DOE national labs, because they're a very important part of that. And uh, I think uh, we have uh, in the past overlooked that. Uh, I think our labs do a wonderful job, and I'm not just saying that because Argonne National Lab is in my district, uh, but we should always look for ways to make their work on technology transfer easier. Uh, as I said when the report came out, I intend to work with the authors to implement some of the recommendations in the report. I want to start out and uh, ask, talk about the uh, ACT agreements. I know there's uh, been some talk about that uh, already. Uh, but uh, I know that these agreements are intended to provide a flexible framework for negotiations of intellectual property rights to facilitate uh, the technology transfer moving from the lab to the marketplace. Uh, right now, it's, it's a pilot program uh, established last year by DOE, and I understand that only few labs are able to enter into ACT agreements at present. So I wanted to hear from, from the panel, both from Mr. Mr. Stepp and Mr. Spencer, also from the National Lab perspective, from Dr. Mason and uh, Arvizu, uh, do you think that the ACT agreements could be utilized by all DOE labs to, uh, to facilitate technology transfer? Let's we'll start with Mr. Stepp. Uh, absolutely, yes. I think ultimately, as a group, when we were discussing what our ideal collaborative agreement would look like, ACT comes relatively close in terms of its flexibility, so I see no reason why all the labs can't use it. 
Yeah, I, I would just add to that that as that expands, however, we need to make sure we put a premium on transparency. Um, that's going to be really important if what we recommend is implemented and we give a lot more flexibility to how these interactions take place. It's going to be really important that we're able to see from an oversight perspective exactly what's going on there. So we need to make sure we couple the, the, the additional flexibility with maximum transparency. Thank you. Dr. Mason? Um, I, as you note, know, it's ACT is currently a, a pilot, and that's partly because it is a new thing. And I think there are some labs who elected not to participate in the pilot, not because it would be impossible for them to implement, but just simply because they wanted to wait and see how it worked out. So my expectation is that, that uh, if the initial feedback is positive in terms of fundamentally faster time to agreement, that's really what ACT is about, uh, then that will encourage some of the labs who haven't participated in the pilot to, to join in. Um, you know, in the end, the way that ACT works, it allows the contractor who operates the lab to serve as a buffer, essentially, between what looks like a more normal business-to-business uh, -business agreement and the requirements of dealing with the federal government. And so the contractor managing the lab has to be willing to serve as that bus buffer. Uh, that involves shouldering some risk. Um, uh, and, and so I think that's why, in some cases, some of the labs have chosen to sort of wait and watch and see how the pilot goes. And, and I, I agree, uh, certainly, with what's been said. In, in addition, I, I think um, it is another tool in the toolbox. I think with the more tools we have, the more flexibility we have, the, the better it is. Uh, even in the pilot, there are some um, um, provisions that probably need to be revisited, one of which is that uh, AC, we cannot do an ACT agreement with an entity that is receiving government funding. And so we need to do something uh, maybe to, to relieve that constraint because that really eliminates a great deal of, of, of companies, small businesses that have an SBIR report, uh, have an SBIR grant, for instance, cannot participate in the ACT. It eliminates that as a, as a particular tool for that group of, of, of uh, companies and, and uh, entities. So there's ways to improve it, uh, but uh, overall I think there's no reason why. Uh, this can't be expanded to all the national labs. Thank you. Mr. Spencer. And it's worth mentioning that we address some of those, that thing specifically in the report. And it's also, I, I would like to just throw out there, that you know, we think it's really important to introduce that those market forces as well in terms of fee bonuses and setting prices and that sort of thing to help facilitate these sorts of interactions. Thank you. I just throw out, I'm going to put in a question for the record uh, asking about uh, increasing the importance of uh, the weight put on technology transfer in uh, the uh, report cards for DOE labs. But I know my time has expired, so I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski. Uh, we do have time for a lightning round. Um, and since there is interest among members of the uh, committee, we will uh, do that now. Uh, each member will have three minutes. Uh, so if the uh, clerks will set the clocks for three minutes, I will begin. And my first question uh, is a segue from uh, Mr. Lipinski's questions. Um, can you tell us how the ACT model is, uh, gives you more flexibility or is a little different from CRADA's and other uh, models that you've used in the past? In a, in a uh, work for others agreement, which ACT is fundamentally an, an alternative to, um, there are a number of provisions that are required because even though the labs are operated by contractors, they are government labs. Uh, and so one, for example, is that essentially the government always has to be in a zero risk position uh, financially. Um, so that if there was a, a cost overrun on a privately funded project and you did not have funds in hands to cover it, that would be an anti-deficiency, which is obviously not a good thing. Someone can go to jail and so forth. So we require payments in advance, 90-day payments in advance. Um, we cannot provide any performance guarantees. So the contract that we would propose to a private sector entity is pay us in advance, we'll do the best we can, and if we can't get it done, you're out of luck. It doesn't resemble what looks like a normal business contract where you might guarantee a price and a deliverable. Um, ACT allows us to sign that kind of contract because the contractor will shoulder that risk. So the government is still protected 
There will be no anti-deficiency. If it takes longer, if it costs more, the contractor will shoulder that burden. Uh, in return, the contractor is allowed to charge uh, an increment on the cost of the work to cover that risk. And that gets to the incentive that Mr. Spencer uh, recognized. Uh, so the contractor will have an incentive to go into those sort of contracts, but the government will always be held harmless. Okay. The hope is that allows us to reach agreement quicker because private sector companies will look at a contract that looks like it has a deliverable, it has a price, and, and we have more flexibility in the IP as well. They just called votes and in a complete surprise to us. So I'm going to give it, but we do have time for each member to ask one question. So um, I will uh, yield the, um, the, the questioning to Mr. Smallwell. Great, and then thank you, Chairman Lummis. Uh, Dr. Mason, uh, other government agencies, universities, industrial laboratories are uh, regulated under OSHA as far as uh, workplace, workplace health and safety uh, conditions. And DOE is unique in maintaining its own environmental safety and health infrastructure for its national laboratories. Do you believe that the safety and productivity of DOE's national laboratories may be better served by shifting and moving the labs to OSHA regulation rather than regulation by the department itself? Uh, and if so, uh, why? This is actually a topic that the National Lab Directors Council has looked at in the past, and, and, and we have uh, recommended that this should be something the department would seriously consider because we do believe there is an opportunity for cost savings. Um, and I think the, the thing that one needs to be very clear on is we are absolutely committed to world-class safety performance in our institutions. So we are not talking about backing away from safety or watering down requirements. It's really a question of what's the most cost-effective way to achieve that safe workplace. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, if you look at, at many of the safest places to work in America today are top-performing companies that are regulated by OSHA, and I believe there's no reason that we can't achieve that same thing just as we do now in the current self-regulated environment that DOE operates. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Thank you. May, may I ask, add a, add a, add a little uh, preamble to that, or a uh, postamble to that? One of the problems that we've looked at that problem before is that OSHA will not take on that responsibility without the facilities of the DOE being in compliance with their requirements. And, and uh, when it was examined last time, there was over $100 million of investments required in order to get into compliance so that that could actually happen. So we need to be cognizant of the fact that that's a, a barrier to actually implementing that particular type of a, of a structure, which I agree with. It's just hard to do unless we have the infrastructure investments required to bring our facilities up to, up to uh, compliance conditions. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Hultgren. Thank you. Uh, real quickly, I know uh, Secretary Muniz had sent a letter to uh, the chairman and ranking member, and uh, in the letter had referenced um, national laboratory directors identifying 20 specific areas for improvement. Uh, department has, he said, went on to say that the department had taken action on 14 of those, action still pending on two agreement to defer four remaining items. I wonder if you could talk briefly about that or if you could kind of get us some information specifically on those 20 areas. I, I, don't, I know I haven't seen those. I'm not sure if other members have seen those. So I wonder if you can comment on that and maybe also follow up in writing for us of uh, some specific areas of improvement that have been identified by lab directors. Yeah, we'll, we'll be happy to provide that, that information, just a very quick comment. This came out of an exercise uh, that, that we called the Burdensome Policies uh, white paper that we did uh, a couple years ago at the request of Secretary Chu. Um, I think he was a little bit tired of lab directors coming in and complaining that it was too hard and too expensive to get our jobs done. And he said, I need specifics. I need specific examples of things that I can work on. And so as a group, we, we collected ideas and synthesized them into this burdensome policies document, which we'll share with the committee. And, uh, and DOE uh, has, has begun working on those. And in fact, you know, none of them are transformational, world-changing things, but many of the reasons that we feel frustrated in terms of effectiveness and cost is not because of big things. It's a layering over decades of a whole bunch of small things, and we've got to work them away. So we'll provide that to you. Thank you. I yield back. 
I think the idea of a burdensome practices memo would be good for our leadership as well. Um, I, uh, uh, Mr. Lipinski. Thank you. I'll get back to what I had uh, was talking about at the end of uh, my first round there. Um, I just briefly say right now, technology transfer activities usually count for about for less than five percent of the overall grade for a lab on the report card. And uh, but the the report um, advocates uh, raising the priority of technology transfer to the same level of importance as other items like business systems and laboratory leadership. So I, I just wanted to um, uh, ask Dr. Arvizu and Dr. Mason about the uh, report's recommendations about raising the uh, the weight the technology transfer is given on these lab report cards. What your thoughts are on that? Mm -hmm. Dr. Vizu? Yeah, so, so the first thing I would say is that not all labs are the same, and, and, and Dr. Mason can talk about the, the, uh, the Office of Science labs. Uh, it, certainly in the case of, of NREL, we've had as a, essentially one of the major elements of our performance evaluation management plan, a, um, uh, a topic called accelerating commercialization and increasing deployment. So it, it uh, started off three years ago as 25% of our grade. Um, last year it was 10% of our grade. Uh, this year is 15% of our grade, so it's, it's kind of moving around a little bit, but there's actually uh, a, a line that, that does that. I think it really depends on the uh, mission of the specific uh, 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 grading entity. In our case, it's EERE. Uh, this is what they care about, and it is part of our grade, but it's not true and uniform across the other labs. Yeah, I think, I think it, it does, and I think it's noted in the report, need to be uh, varied depending on the nature of the mission in the lab. But I think overall the reality is that if you place a high priority on something, that is what will happen. And, and in many cases I think there would be an advantage to elevating the priority. Uh, recognizing that it's not just about licensing agreements. There are many different ways we can interact with industry through our user facilities. And even in the fundamental science labs like Fermilab, you know, picking up on the remarks from Representative Holtgren, you know, there are things that Fermilab has done to support the development of proton therapy for cancer therapy that have had tremendous impact. It may not take the form of a licensing agreement with industry, but there are now proton therapy centers being built around the country modeled on Loma Linda that was a a uh, key role that Fermilab played in putting it together. So there are many different ways to measure it, um, but I think if you do elevate the priority, it will get more focus at the labs. Thank you. I want to thank the chair for holding this hearing. Uh, I think it's very important that we, uh, we look at this report and um, uh, follow up also on some of the recommendations. So thank you. I thank every member of this committee and our staff. I thank our witnesses. It, it's really encouraging that the same week of Secretary Moniz's announcement, uh, the think tanks released a report entitled Turning the Page, Reimagining the National Labs in the 21st Century Innovation Economy. Particularly encouraging because you put out a 70-page detailed report. It's a reminder that we can do things on a bipartisan basis where we see opportunities for policy improvement. The report included a bevy of bold recommendations, uh, including enhanced technology transfer, reducing micromanagement and bureaucracy, changing the DOE organizational structure and fundamental relationships with the national labs. Since collectively they manage more than $10 billion worth of scientific and national security, it's important that we give thoughtful consideration to these issues. Um, we recognize that the labs sponsor cutting edge basic research and manage world class user facilities. And it's a driving force behind the US global scientific leadership and economic competitiveness. So we're looking very forward uh, to continuing these discussions. We thank Secretary Moniz for his response to our letter so promptly. We are delighted with the work you've been doing uh, to advance a more robust uh, scientific exploratory environment in a way that unleashes American competitiveness. I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the committee may have additional questions for you and we will ask you to respond to those in writing. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and written questions. 
from the members. Again, with our considerable thanks, the witnesses are excused and this hearing is adjourned.